The Tom Woods Show, episode 2216. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you enjoy The Tom Woods Show, it's time to go to the next level. And next level Tom Woods is libertyclassroom.com. This is where my friends and I teach all the stuff you did not get in your conventional education, history, economics, and more, the way it ought to be taught with all the content they left out or distorted. Check it out at libertyclassroom.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. I'm delighted to be talking to Peter Klein today. We both spent the weekend in Phoenix, Arizona at the 40th Anniversary Supporters Summit of the Mises Institute. Absolutely great time. We're talking to Peter, though, about his brand new book, Why Managers Matter, The Perils of the Bossless Company. Peter holds a PhD in economics from the University of California at Berkeley, and he's a professor of entrepreneurship at Baylor University. Welcome back, Peter. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me. All right, let's dig into this. Obviously, we could say a lot about the Mises Institute event. Maybe we should say a brief word about that. I gave a luncheon talk called the Lou Rockwell I know, which was a surprise because Lou would hate to talk about him, but doggone it, that's what he got. <laughs> but we had a really great time. Everybody was in great spirits. The donors were all thrilled. It was terrific in a beautiful location as well. So nice to see old friends and meet new ones and celebrate the incredible accomplishments of Lou Rockwell and the entire team over the last four decades. Well, let's talk about your book because, of course, you're swimming against if not a major trend in reality, then you're swimming against a widespread perception about trends and about what should happen when it comes to the organization of a company. And it's an expression of, on some level, of egalitarianism, which is egalitarianism is at odds with hierarchy and uncomfortable with hierarchy and feels like any hierarchical relationships have to be justified. And they apparently don't think that hierarchical relationships in a firm are justified, and they'll give examples of, look at this innovative firm, and this one, and this one, and this one does it this way, and this one does things that way, and it's not like the stupid old way we used to do things. Hence your book. So what's the standard case they try to make for a quote-unquote bossless company? Yeah, well, to start with a little bit of broader context, since you brought it up, I mean, most listeners of the Tom Woods show are sympathetic to ideas about individual liberty and giving people the maximum freedom to act in the political sphere, meaning that we don't favor restrictions on the behavior of individuals and groups, restrictions imposed by the state. But as you well know, you know there is one strand within that broader kind of libertarian movement that goes beyond the political understanding of liberty and also seeks to impose a kind of egalitarian or libertine, you know, larger philosophy of life, that we should all be, you know, so-called autonomous individuals, that we shouldn't be linked together in families, communities, churches, and other organizations. So your listeners well know that the way that human beings typically relate to each other, often relate to each other, is not only sort of horizontally peer to peer, but also, you know, vertically parent to child and employee to employer and, you know, congregant to pastor or priest. We have natural leaders and we often form ourselves in human societies, right, into different kinds of groups where some of us voluntarily submit to guidance, wisdom, or even authority, right, from those to whom we deem it appropriate. Well, you know, that being sort of the zeitgeist of our modern kind of egalitarian era, that any kind of vertical structure, any kind of form of hierarchy or authority, even completely private ones, is somehow illegitimate or dehumanizing or demeaning. Within that context, there has been in the last couple of decades, a whole genre of books that are ostensibly just basic management texts, how to be a better manager, how to organize a company, how to make companies perform better. But the subtext of this genre is that this kind of egalitarian philosophy should also apply in the workplace. In other words, any kind of system of organization where you have bosses and workers, employers and employees, managers with subordinates and so forth, even if you know everyone in this organization voluntarily and willingly agreed 
to be organized in this way, that that's somehow illegitimate, it's somehow, you know, at best inefficient and unproductive. And therefore, companies, you know, like human society, right, should be organized, you know, in the flattest, leanest way possible. So companies should get rid of all the middle managers, should delayer or flatten their hierarchies, or even eliminate their hierarchies altogether and, you know, have every worker be his own boss. So what we do in the book is we offer a critical commentary on this genre of management literature, what we call the bossless company narrative, the idea that bossing is bad, bossing is legitimate, all companies should be completely flat, and we show that that narrative is misplaced, both on theoretical grounds, historical grounds, empirical grounds, and we offer an alternative for the role of the manager you know, in the 21st century and the information age and so forth. And we show how management can be used effectively to, you know, sort of harness human creativity and encourage cooperation, not allowing everyone to sort of act as his own boss, but yet to provide some guidance within which, you know, human creativity can flourish. All right, let me play devil's advocate here before we get into some of the details of the argument. Because of COVID, of course, a lot of people were not going into the office anymore. As we all know, people were working from home. And likewise, students were being educated from home. One of the things parents found when their students being educated from home was how dumb most of the school day was and it was all busy work or whatever, and that you could get it all done in like an hour and a half, right? <laughs> like two hours, right. something like that. Now, I don't know how true that is because I wasn't in that situation, but I'm sure there's some truth to that. Well, likewise, people have been saying, ah, you know, this really helped to expose the stupidity of the traditional form of organization inside a firm because it really, really brought home to me how lumbering and stupid my manager is. And I mean, I already knew it before that I'm, I know I could be three times more productive, but this idiot won't let me be. So the standard thing you read in people writing articles about my soulless, life-sucking corporate job is that I have to work for a moron all the time. I'm constantly working for idiots. And the way the workday is organized amounts to a complete waste of time. Like five of the hours, nobody's at their peak performance. It's all a big, stupid, dumb waste of time. So how could a bossless company be worse seems to be the argument. Now, the way you would respond traditionally to that would be to say, well, in a free market, of course, you would think a firm with a smart manager is going to outperform one with a dumb manager. And a firm where they haven't figured out how to optimize their employees' time is going to suffer to one that has. And yet, if you talk to a lot of people in these jobs, they just don't seem to think that's what's happening. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I mean, look, at one level, there's a trope in our culture about, you know, sort of the middle manager who doesn't do anything productive but looks over your shoulder and gets in your way. Think of the uh, pointy-headed boss from the classic Dilbert comic strips or think of the Michael Scott character or the Dwight Schrute character from The Office, right? That's the image that many of us have of the soulless, soul-crushing experience of working in a cubicle and being surrounded by, you know, these people who are slightly higher than you in the org chart, but just preventing you from doing your job. And look, you know, there are many office workplaces that aren't well-run, that aren't well-managed, that don't have the right kind of management, as you said. I mean, from an economics perspective, we would certainly, as you say, expect that firms that have the wrong kind of management structure in place and the wrong managers in place will be outperformed, you know, by firms that have a better, more effective management structure. You could also point out from the individual's point of view, you know, if things are really that bad being part of an organization where you lack the full autonomy to make your own decisions, to create value without, you know, the man stripping part of it away from you, well, then you're welcome to go out on your own right? And form your own company, be an entrepreneur, be an independent contractor who, you know, deals on an ad hoc basis with other people. There's nothing stopping us from doing that, right? But the fact is most people at the end of the day don't want to do that. They don't want to bear the responsibility for making all of these decisions. They don't want to have to make payroll. You know, they prefer a steady paycheck. And many people are willing to give up a little bit of, you know, what feels subjectively, emotionally, like a more empowering experience for the benefit of reducing risk, you know, having a steady paycheck, letting somebody else, you know, stay up late at night worrying about payroll. 
the comment on COVID is a good one. I mean, look, as far as the school day is concerned, what many parents thankfully learned is that public schools are among the worst managed organizations that most of us are familiar with. But also keep in mind, you know, having a remote workforce is not the same as having a flatter hierarchy, right? So look at me, for example. I mean, unlike the great entrepreneur, Thomas E. Woods, I'm just a, you know, my, I'm just a bureaucrat working for the man, you know, picking up a salary, working as a professor at a university. I have a lot of autonomy about how I conduct my day-to-day affairs, right? What I put in my classes, what books and articles I assign to my students. They're all, you know, authors who have appeared on the Tom Woods show, of course, how I grade my exams, and even many of the times where I work. I mean, I'm not required to be in the office nine to five. I can work from home. I can work from the coffee shop. As long as I'm fulfilling my obligations to my students and others, the exact means by which I do so is largely up to me, but I'm still part of a corporate hierarchy, a nonprofit corporate hierarchy, right? I get a paycheck, I report to bosses, there's some supervision. And part of the reason for that is, look, I mean, think about education, Right. We can all consume education in an ad hoc fashion by watching YouTube videos and reading books. And many of us are self educated on many topics in that way. But there is also some benefit to kind of having a curated set of materials that we can consume, you know, maybe in a particular sequence where one idea builds upon another. Now, one way you could do that is to have a third party, you know, like yourself, Tom, and other you know, public figures who who lay out a curriculum and encourage people, hey, do we've picked the books and articles for you. We've picked some courses for you. You know, please do these things in this order. But another way to do it is to pursue a degree, right, within a university or some kind of other special program where, you know, there's some coordination across classes. So at my university, students are pursuing an accredited degree. I have a lot of autonomy for what to do in my class. But the material that I present, the topics that I cover, have to match the topics and material that are covered in the other courses that all, you know, sort of are combined into a major or a degree program or whatever. So that's a good illustration of the, in many cases, not in all, but in many cases for some kind of coordination across different persons, across different units, and often a formal organization is the most effective way to provide that coordination. Well, can you describe for us an example of the type of quote-unquote bossless firm that people point to today as a model for others, just so people understand what this would look like? Yeah, great. I mean, there really aren't any literal bossless companies out there, but there are some companies, both past and present, that have very famously flat structures. Contemporary examples that are often discussed are uh, Valve, which is a video game company that's now really a video game platform. The online retailer Zappos, that's now part of Amazon. Slightly older examples include Gore, the maker of Gore-Tex, the fabric, the high-tech fabric that a lot of us use for, you know, outdoor clothing. Morningstar, a California-based tomato company that has a famously decentralized or disaggregated structure. A good example at present is Hire, which is a Chinese manufacturer of appliances and other industrial products that also embraces this sort of very fluid kind of bottom-up structure. When you look at these companies in detail, what they really mean by claiming that they're bossless or near bossless is, you know, they're highly decentralized. So employees have a lot more autonomy than is true in the typical workforce. And sometimes the way different people work together is sort of organic and fluid where workers can spontaneously form themselves into, you know, self-organized teams to work on a particular issue or problem then that team dissolves and another sort of you know team is formed. One famous management guru described this form as an ad hocracy as opposed to a you know a hierarchy or a traditional kind of organizational structure. People organize themselves and get together and work on projects in an ad hoc fashion as they feel like they need to without a lot of top-down guidance. And these are real companies that really have at one time or another experimented with very, very flat structures. But as we discussed in the book, almost all of them, with one or two exceptions, abandoned their experiment, you know, after a few months or years, discovering that the drawbacks of really flat organizational structures for them were outweighing the benefits. 
All right. There are a few chapters of this that I want to get the gist of that I think will help people. What do you think, is there anything that the, again, I, we realize that literally there's no bossless company, but we'll call the people the advocates of the bossless company. What do they have to say that is worth listening to, even if their proposed remedy might not be so wise? Yeah, where the proponents of the bossless company narrative are right is that a sort of traditional top-down command and control model has many, many disadvantages, right? Number one, think of our old friend F.A. Hayek, who emphasized the role of tacit knowledge in societies. Well, those same principles often apply within organizations as well. And not to overuse this example, but, you know, I get instructions from the president of the university and the provost and the dean, you know, maybe the department chair about certain things that I should or should not do in the classroom or how I should interact with my students. But I have a a lot more knowledge about the specific subject matter that I've been assigned than those people who are above me in the organizational hierarchy. So it would make no sense for the president or the dean to tell me what textbook to use, to tell me what exam questions to write, to tell me what grades to assign, right? Because I have the local knowledge, much of which exists as Hayek would say, in a sort of tacit or difficult to articulate form. So a complete top-down sort of model would not make sense for that reason. Also, from the point of view of, you know, incentives and motivation, you know, I'm, I'm happier when I have more autonomy to make my own decisions. So there are definite advantages in terms of making better use of specific knowledge, in terms of providing strong performance incentives, or employees, and even sort of subjective feelings of well-being. I like the feeling of autonomy. I like believing that, you know, I have some control over my own destiny, you know, at work. And so those are all positives. Those are all benefits of more bottom-up as opposed to top-down measures. What the authors that were criticizing in the book sort of stop their explanation there, and they ignore the fact that, you know, there are benefits and costs. There are also drawbacks to the bottom-up model and the right kind of organizational structure for a particular company in a particular set of circumstances is found by, you know, balancing on the margin those benefits and costs and finding exactly the right blend of sort of managerial coordination and top-down spontaneous interaction, you know, that solves the organization's problems in the most effective way. You have a section called Show Us the Evidence, because some people might want to know if we review some of the scholarly work on this general subject of how we should arrange the company in terms of hierarchical relationships, what do we find? Because what we typically are hearing are anecdotes about, well, here's kind of an oddball company over here you might want to look at. And here's a, and what sometimes happens is when you look more closely at that company, it's way more hierarchical than they let on when they were you know, initially trying to pique your interest. But is there anything, is there a lot of scholarly work done on this that can help us evaluate this question? Yeah, there's a lot less systematic evidence than one would think by listening to these sort of gurus. I mean, as you pointed out, first of all, when you look under the hood, when you look more closely at a lot of the, you know, famous anecdotes. And again, there, you know, there's a handful, there's, you know, a half dozen or so companies, I've already mentioned the names, right, that get talked about over and over and over again as this is the exemplar, this is the model, this is what all companies should be doing. Well, it's a very small set of examples. Most of the time, when you look more closely, you find that either, as I mentioned before, these companies really did adopt a very flat structure, but they quickly you know, gave it up. They went back to a more conventional structure because they found that it didn't work well. In other cases, the company did maintain what on the surface looks like a very flat structure. But in reality, it's not quite that way. Valve is a classic example because there are a lot of insider accounts of Valve claiming that, well, yeah, there weren't a lot of formal managerial titles, but there were certain people in the organization who had de facto authority or de facto power because they were close to the CEO, because they were bullies. You know, one former employee described Valve as a lot like a high school where you've got the cool kids, you know, who really run the show. And then you've got the nerds or whatever who get bullied and picked on. Even though none of these persons had formal managerial titles, there were people who de facto exercised a lot of top-down authority in the company. But third, there have been some attempts to do more systematic 
studies on the entire economy or broad sectors of the economy using surveys and secondary data. And that evidence is surprisingly thin. There are a few studies suggesting that, you know, in manufacturing, for example, there has been a little bit of delayering. In other words, you know, to the extent that you can sort of count the number of layers between the CEO and, you know, the guy on the shop room floor, there's some evidence that in many industries, that number has been getting smaller. So the number of middle managers has been going down for many firms in many industries. However, it doesn't follow from that, that these firms are really giving workers on the front lines more authority or autonomy. What you often find is that these slightly flatter structures encourage top level employees, you know, the CEO, the top executives, top managers to actually intervene even more than they did before in the activities of the lower level employees. We mentioned in the book, this famous quote from Elon Musk, where he's describing Tesla as the kind of organization where, you know, there are no walls. We've broken down all the barriers between people. Anybody at Tesla can talk to anybody else at Tesla without having to go through a third party. The implication being, you know, if I'm the custodian, you know, cleaning the toilets at Tesla at the factory and I have some issue or problem, I can get to Elon Musk himself. I can make a phone call, I can send an email, and I can be in direct contact with Elon Musk. You know, isn't that great? Well, you know, you talk to employees at Tesla, a lot of them say they're not actually comfortable with the idea that Elon Musk is only one phone call or one email away from them, right? They would actually prefer a few layers of middle management as a buffer to sort of protect them from, you know, over intrusion from a higher level manager who really doesn't know what's going on on the shop room floor and wants to feel like, oh, I'm really sort of, you know, helping my employees and so forth. So there has been a little bit of flatness, but it's not obvious that that has led to the kind of workplace democracy that the proponents of the bossless company narrative seem to want. What can learning about what a company is actually supposed to be, or maybe the theory of the firm, how does that shed light on this question? And maybe in your answer, is there any way you could shoehorn the work of Alfred Chandler into your answer? Because years and years ago, in the early 90s, I was actually the desk man at his apartment building. And oh, so wow. I delivered his mail and you know he would come in and out. He was of quite advanced age and yeah. rather hunched over by them. But everybody spoke in hushed tones. Oh, yeah. here comes Professor Chandler. So whatever you can say. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. And just as a small aside, when I was doing some work on Murray Rothbard's papers and correspondence after he passed away, I discovered some correspondence between Rothbard and Alfred D. Chandler Sr., the oh. father of the famous Harvard business historian. And apparently they were quite friendly. And Chandler Sr. was inviting Rothbard to come down to, I guess it was Wilmington, Delaware, where the family lived to have some meetings or maybe give some lectures. And I don't know whether those meetings ever took place. Oh, wow. Uh, but it doesn't seem like Murray had a lot of influence on Al Jr. <laughs> but no, no. To answer your question, and let me answer it in a slightly roundabout way. You know, I'm very interested in my, you know, scholarly career and work on questions about what is a company or a lot of my work is about incorporating insights from Austrian economics into the so-called theory of the firm you know, understanding why business firms exist, what functions do they serve, how are they organized, how should they be governed, and so forth. Work associated with people like Ronald Coase, my dissertation advisor, Oliver Williamson, Chandler, and others as well. We wanted in this book, now this book is not aimed at an academic audience. It's aimed at professional managers and interested lay readers who would like to know more about organizations and companies. So, you know, it's very readable. We deliberately avoided any sort of very detailed academic, you know, sort of pedantic conversations. However, we did want to include some accessible, reader friendly summaries of the contributions of, you know, these classic thinkers on this topic. So there is a chapter where we sort of lay out the basic economic or economic theories of the firm and try to relate them to our broader theme. Because part of what we're arguing, and I hinted at this before, is look, if the traditionally organized company or if a company with any kind of managerial structure or any kind of hierarchy at all 
you know, has all these problems that proponents of the bossless company narrative, you know, point to, then why have companies at all? I mean, why do these things form in the first place? Why wouldn't everyone be an entrepreneur? Why wouldn't every firm be a mom and pop? Or to quote some of our left libertarian friends, why wouldn't all people organize themselves into a worker-owned cooperative, you know, where everyone is equal and has an equal say? Throughout most of human history, that isn't how we've organized ourselves, whether for economic activities or any other activities. You know, what's the reason? Is it because, you know, the king imposed this structure on us? Is it because of some illegitimate activity by the state? I think the answer is no. Although the state certainly has intervened in the economy in you know, countless ways, as you well know. But the reason that people often organize themselves into groups to produce goods and services is because it's more efficient to do so. It's because of the advantages of specialization and the division of labor, or what Mises called the Ricardian law of association. We can be more productive when we specialize. You know, when Tom Wood specializes in you know, running a podcast and Peter Klein specializes in talking about this specific topic on the podcast, you know, we get better podcasts than if you were the podcast organizer and the speaker every week, and I were organizing my own podcasts on, you know, my topics of choice every week. So there are advantages to the division of labor. And in many cases, we can most effectively realize these advantages with some delegation of decision-making authority, right? So Think about Leonard Reed's famous example of the pencil. Everyone knows the SAI pencil. One thing that Leonard Reed leaves out of his story is that many of the stages in which the different pieces of the pencil are assembled are coordinated by an entrepreneur, by a manager who brings these different factors of production together and provides some guidance in deciding how they'll be combined and how they'll be recombined when new circumstances arise. It's often very difficult to affect all of that coordination purely at sort of arm's length transactions between legally independent entities, because you've got to negotiate, you've got to write contracts, you've got to enforce those contracts. Sometimes it's more efficient, you know, for Peter Klein to go to Tom Woods and say, look, Tom, instead of negotiating about every podcast, let's strike the following deal. I'll agree to be your regular podcast guest. We'll sign one contract. The contract says, within certain limits, Peter agrees that, I'm not pitching myself for a job, by the way, but hypothetically, Peter agrees that, you know, every Wednesday at nine o'clock, he will show up and he will talk about whatever Tom wants him to talk about. You know, that's the contract. And that contract will last over a certain duration. And maybe there are some limits. There are a few topics that are out of bounds. We're going to try to stick within this range, but subject to those restrictions being met, I will agree to do whatever you, Tom, think is best to do that day. That's a basic employer-employee relationship. The employee agrees to show up at the employer's place of work and perform whatever task the employer needs to be performed on that day. That is often a more effective way of affecting a collaboration, a more efficient way of bringing together these different factors of production than negotiating every day, every hour, every minute on every specific task. Moreover, if tasks are interdependent, you know, you got Peter Klein doing the Wednesday talks and you've got, you know, Tom DiLorenzo doing the Tuesday talks. Maybe you need to make sure that our talks match up and allowing you to assign a portfolio of tasks to your staff, right, is more efficient, more effective than a series of bilateral negotiations that take place every day. That's the basic coordination-based theory of the firm or transaction cost theory of the firm that was first articulated by Ronald Coase. And what Chandler did is show, using historical case studies, that the reason for the emergence of medium-sized and then later large enterprises, large vertically integrated firms, large diversified firms like General Motors, DuPont, and so forth, was because having some degree of central coordination was more efficient in terms of reducing these negotiation or transaction costs than having a larger set of more independent standalone units. I think Chandler downplayed to some extent the degree to which other institutional factors like law and regulation were playing a role in determining the specific outcomes that he studied. But Chandler's work was extremely influential in saying, 
hey, there may actually be a good reason why large companies exist other than, you know, Marxist exploitation theory. And we ought to try to understand those better. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. When we're confident and well-adjusted, we can stay in problem-solving mode all the time. But when we're not, and we find ourselves faced with a challenge, we can easily get knocked off balance, catastrophizing, worrying about the worst possible outcome, and obsessing over the problems rather than working on solutions. Well, a therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals. Years ago, when I faced a difficult issue in my own life, not only did I go to a therapist, I actually went to BetterHelp specifically. And before too long, the issue was resolved. So if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option, I can tell you from my own personal experience. It's so convenient, it's accessible, it's affordable, it's entirely online, no long drives or waiting rooms, and you get matched with a therapist after you fill out just a brief survey, and you can switch therapists anytime. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash woods today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash woods. How is it possible that you could argue that managers encourage innovation when people's instincts, I think, are that it's the rogue employee who brings about innovation, whereas the manager tends to be the play it safe, conservative type who wants you to just keep your head down in your cubicle and keep doing what you've been doing? Yeah, probably our most provocative, even shocking chapter in the book is the one where we try to make the case or we lay out some reasons why the managerial hierarchy, again, not in every case, but in some cases, can actually lead to more creativity and innovation than a more flat structure. The reason that strikes most of us as sort of an outlandish claim is, again, because we have these tropes in our mind, not only of the frustrated employee who, you know, ends up moonlighting on the side, to innovate because the company doesn't recognize the value of the innovation and then that employee splits off and does his own thing. Or we have this image of, you know, the teenage garage entrepreneur, you know, Steve Jobs tinkering in his garage to produce the Apple II, Apple I, Apple II, and so forth. The lone inventor. Think how many films and movies are about this. The lone inventor who's always being, you know, pushed aside by the big establishment companies because they don't want their existing business models to be threatened. You know, some inventor has come up with, they used to talk about carburetors, but, you know, has come out with some automotive invention that will allow a car to go 100 miles, you know, on a gallon of gasoline. But then the big automobile companies, you know, work to crush this person because it would threaten their profitability. That's the sort of left-wing kind of stereotype that most of us have in mind of the relationship between big companies and innovation. Well, as usual, that's almost all myth, right? Of course, there have been breakthrough innovations that have come from outsiders, from startup companies, from people who have been frustrated by perhaps a stifling environment in an existing company, but that's more the exception than the norm. In fact, the majority of useful, valuable technological innovations have come from large established companies. Why? Number one, because doing the background work to produce innovations is often very costly, right? That's one thing the Austrians have always emphasized in you know, Mises' understanding of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is not just about ideas, right? It requires resources. Resources have to be committed to fund experiments and to do the background scientific or technical research, to do prototyping and you know, run products through focus groups and so forth. So Standalone inventors, inventors in their garages and basements typically lack the resources that are necessary to provide breakthrough innovations. You often need some kind of you know, patronage or sponsorship, not only financially, but also someone to encourage the production of this innovation to figure out how it might fit in, you know, what its commercial viability might be. I mean, look, of course, are there great innovations that are discovered serendipitously, accidentally? Of course. Are there important innovations that come about, you know, from outside sort of the standard system? Of course there are. But if we're looking more systematically at the evidence, there are many, many cases where the corporate hierarchy actually encourages and stimulates innovation. Again, because what do large companies want to do? They want to be profitable. They want to grow. They want to maintain their market value. And while, of course, many of them miss the boat, 
right? Kodak famously whiffed on digital photography. There's a famous book by Clayton Christensen, a Harvard former Harvard Business School professor, on how many large companies overlook some potentially game-changing or disruptive innovations. So, of course, that takes place you know, at some times. But there are just as many, if not more, cases of innovations coming out of large established organizations that have the resources and the foresight to figure out how these innovations might be valuable down the road. Again, Tom, what we're arguing, you know, our basic message in the book is that there are no one-size-fits-all solutions. There are no, you know, one-size-fits-all answers to these kind of questions. Are there cases where flatter structures provide advantages, including on the innovation side? Absolutely. Are there cases where the drawbacks exceed the benefits? Absolutely as well. So most the management literature does not really like nuance. And if you're trying to sell books, you know, nuance isn't uh, isn't always the right way to go. But essentially, that's the message of this book, that, you know, the right way to manage and organize a company is contingent upon particular circumstances. And one needs to be very cautious and careful and not just follow sort of the latest fad of the day. Well, speaking of the latest fad of the day, let me wrap up by asking you, are you teaching entrepreneurship at a business school, presumably, right? That's right. Yes. Okay. So you might be familiar with what's being taught in other business schools. Is this current fad being taught as the wave of the future or as an interesting oddity or not at all? Yeah, good question. I would say it doesn't dominate the curriculum, but yes, there's a hint. There are undertones in a lot of the entrepreneurship curricula at many universities and colleges that essentially success for one of these programs is for students in the program graduates of the program, not to go on to work for established organizations, but to create their own startups, you know, that will sort of, you know, change the world and make people better off and so forth, that that's somehow morally more worthy than working for an established organization. And I sort of fight against that very hard at my own school and in my own teaching, that I'm trying to convey an understanding of entrepreneurship in the Misesian sense, right, as an abstract economic function of taking bold, decisive action in the face of uncertainty, being willing to put you know, resources at stake, to have skin in the game, to exercise responsibility about how goods and services will be produced. Now, oftentimes that is manifest in the form of a startup company or a high growth, you know, venture funded, you know, tech firm, but not always, right? One can also exercise the entrepreneurial function in a variety of ways, including within established companies in more quote unquote traditional industries. And I certainly don't think any one, you know, approach in the marketplace has more worth or value kind of in a fundamental sense than another. But I think everyone can learn to apply these ways of thinking and acting, these ways of understanding the world, you know, including people in all kinds of organizations. So again, I'd say there are undertones that flatter, bossless structures are better than more conventional ones. But, you know, I work very hard to try to break through that in my own teaching and writing and speaking on entrepreneurship. I remember years ago, let's not mention names because why not? But years ago, you had an exchange, I think, on the Mises blog with another professor who is broadly within the libertarian world, but whose opinion was that in a true free market with no subsidies or regulations from the state, you would be much more likely to have flatter organizational structures in companies. You'd have a a wider variety of such structures. And the argument behind this, in part, was that the particular set of incentives that the state provides tends to encourage larger firms, and I don't know if that also means more hierarchical firms, I'm not sure how that follows, But you were polite but insistent that the evidence for these claims was more or less anecdotal to non-existent. So to what extent is this book related to that distant argument, which was not strictly about hierarchy, but I think it was partly about it? Yes, I would definitely say I've been inspired by reflecting upon that exchange. Maybe we can link to it in the show notes because I thought it was a very interesting conversation. So look in my, you know, how does this book fit into my broader research portfolio? Certainly in one sense, I'm responding to a school of thought within my own community 
the sort of broadly libertarian community that does embrace a version of the bossless company narrative, claiming not only that hierarchical organizations are inefficient and only exist because of state intervention, but also raising a number of ethical issues that, you know, having a boss or bossing people around or some of our friends in this movement refer to bossism, you know, that bossism is per se objectionable on normative grounds as well as, you know, potentially on positive grounds. So I certainly was thinking about that as this book project came together. We don't address much of that literature directly in the book, though there are a few hints sort of here and there. But as I mentioned before, I mean, the sort of libertarian argument against hierarchy, it certainly is based on a kernel of truth, right? Namely, that in the mixed economy, right, in an interventionist economic system like the one that we have today, it is absolutely correct that many large companies and large hierarchical companies benefit from all kinds of state privilege, right? They have subsidies, they have tax incentives, they have monopoly protection. There's a whole host of interventions that provide benefits to large companies and large hierarchical companies. Gee, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could repeal those interventions and let competition do its thing? I absolutely agree. However, that's only half of the story, right? On the empirical side, historical side, one must also take into account that there exist many government policies that do precisely the opposite, that impose artificial shackles on corporate growth, right? That impose all kinds of burdens and restrictions on large, diversified, hierarchical enterprises and provide all kinds of direct and indirect subsidies and privileges for smaller firms. So, you know, exactly what would happen if we were to remove all these constraints? Well, look, I mean, ultimately, that's an empirical question. Let's run the experiment and see Let's find out. My conjecture is we would not see a huge increase in mom and pops. Again, for the economic reasons we've already been discussing, that there are many advantages in terms of bringing about more effective coordination and cooperation from having some kind of a managerial structure. And then again, on theoretical grounds and on sort of philosophical grounds, I don't at all agree with the claim that when people voluntarily subject themselves, they put themselves under someone else's leadership including, you know, willingness to sign the kind of employment contract that we described before. I don't think that violates my autonomy, you know, doesn't violate the dignity of the human person. I don't think there's anything incompatible with liberty as you and I would understand it. And a system in which we voluntarily subject ourselves to other people's authority, sometimes on a short-term basis, sometimes on a longer-term basis. So I think the left libertarian argument is misplaced on those grounds. One other point I should mention, Tom, because I don't know if it's really come up yet in our conversation is, you know, we do offer in the book, you know, a positive description of what we think good management looks like. And one of the points that we make is, you know, good management, contrary to popular assumption, does not necessarily mean top-down command and control, right? What it means instead is sort of establishing procedures and setting up guidelines designing what we call the rules of the game within which people can act, you know, with some degree of autonomy and independence. So it's sort of, you know, laying out the system within which people can interact. That's what good managers do. Resolving disputes that arise, intervening to settle disagreements that come about as people try to work together. That's what good management is. It's not looking over people's shoulders and telling them what to do, but it's helping to create an environment within which people can do their jobs well. Well, the book is Why Managers Matter, The Perils of the Bossless Company. I'll link to it on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 2216. And I I like reading books that go against the tide because that's pretty much all I ever read or write. <laughs> so it fits in well with my preferences. This is definitely in, in the Tom Woods genre in that sense. <laughs> that's right. All right, well, congratulations on it, Peter, and I appreciate your time today. Thanks very much for having me. Love talking about it, Tom. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.